Uh, Jonathan Engel, we already heard about the death, death theorem. He has done work in several other things, in particular spin phones and look quantum cosmology. And today we'll have another unique, uh, uniqueness talk about the uniqueness of ki kinematics and minimal dynamics in look quantum cosmology. So, John, are you ready? Thank you. This is for yeah, yes, 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 <laughs> of course. That's not the direction. This one. Okay, these are for slides. Okay, good, thank you. So um, I, I thank the uh, organizers and Yurik for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, I met Yurik when I was a PhD student. And, I mean, I met several people here when I was a PhD student, uh, like um, uh, Hanno and Christian, and of course my, my advisor, Abai. Uh, and um, at that time, I was very excited when they were doing this lost stuff. I was not involved in it, but uh, I was fortunate to be involved in some further extension of it. And that was a very nice proof, Christian. This is very, it simplifies things a great deal. Yeah, so this, this work, is, this, uh, what I'm presenting here is mostly based on these papers. Uh, in the process of uh, preparing the talk, I uh, decided to uh, make an, what I believe is an improvement of, uh, in how the action of dilations is defined on the algebra, which is what uh, Christian was hinting at earlier, and I'll mention exactly what, what that is. So uh, I start by emphasizing um, what, what I believe is the importance of uniqueness theorems. Usually in, um, in, uh, in science, people uh, produce theories and make predictions, and we test it against experiment, and there's a very rapid, uh, at least much more rapid than, than in quantum gravity, a rapid uh, cycle of the scientific process where we can test the theories and bad theories can be thrown out. And unfortunately, in quantum gravity, we don't have uh, um, contact with observation yet. Uh, and so I always felt like I needed uh, something more to, be, to, to feel confident about a theory. And uniqueness theorems helped me to do that because it, uh, what unique, uniqueness theorems really are is it's telling you how a mathematically precise theory uh, can be specified in terms of scientific principles, which basically anybody would agree to, and a minimal number of choices. And the point is to minimize the choices. Uh, and when we do finally make some sort of contact with uh, observation, if in fact there's something wrong, then uh, we, we've minimized the things which need to be modified. And so I feel like it's, this is physics. And sometimes people say this is mathematics, but I think this is physics, at least, at least for us in quantum gravity. You guys know about the diffeomorphism symmetry. I don't need to go over that. It's fundamental symmetry of general relativity. Uh, and, uh, and I've been interested uh, recently in, in loop quantum cosmology just because um, it, it seems to me the, um, the, the, uh, the area of application of, of uh, loop quantum gravity that's most likely to yield uh, solid uh, predictions, which we might actually compare with experiment, uh, because it's the only uh, application where uh, singularity is basically open to observation to us. We can't see black hole singularities. They're behind an event horizon. So it seems like this is our best hope for, for, for solid predictions from quantum gravity. And a lot of and people are getting closer and closer to, to making contact with observation. So I'm going to begin the talk with kinematics, uniqueness of kinematics. Christian already gave a, a talk on the kinematics. So I don't really need to say too much about it, but I'll just emphasize a few things. Uh, so in the, uh, in full loop quantum gravity, the, the, the lost uh, Yurik and, uh, and uh, these other authors and, and uh, Christian worked on it. And uh, then uh, Thomas, I, and uh, Max worked on the application to isotropic loop quantum cosmology. But there was also work on the kinematics of, uh, of Bianchi 1 loop quantum cosmology that was done by Abai and Miguel Campilia. But I, I'm uh, going to be uh, reviewing the work that I was involved in. Uh, so uh, the starting point here is the algebraic formulation of quantum mechanics, uh, where the, the basic uh, object is the algebra of pre-observables. Usually it's called the algebra of observables, but in constrained Hamiltonian systems, observable has another meaning. So pre-observables is a nice name for it. Um, and the basic construction uh, of this uh, of this uh, quantum algebra it begins with a, a choice of, 
uh, and, uh, of a, a classical algebra of face-based functions, which is closed under addition, multiplication by complex conjugates, complex conjugation, and Poisson brackets. And of course, it should separate points of the phase space. So this is uh, larger than the, than the space that uh, José was talking about earlier when he was uh, talking about the choice of a maximal abelian uh, uh, subalgebra. Uh, because here, we're really talking about uh, phase space functions which can depend on uh, all coordinates, configuration momenta. Uh, and so once you choose this algebra, you just construct the, the, free, the freely generated uh, algebra uh, generated by this, this classical algebra. Uh, and then you divide by uh, an ideal which imposes the relations that we want. Uh, the quantum conditions of Dirac, that's a commutation relations, that they should be equal to the Poisson brackets. Uh, and then there's this uh, anti-commutation relation which is um, sometimes uh, omitted in some uh, uh, works on, uh, algeb on uh, the algebraic formulation of quantum mechanics, but it's actually important. And uh, as far as I know, Abai was the first one to point out the, the, the importance of including this. This was, so I'm, I'm stating this very generally, but uh, in the case that we're interested in, this uh, anti-commutation relation reduces to one of the commutation, uh, the, it reduces to one of the relations that Christian had on his slides. So it, it simplifies even more. And then I, this should also be in the ideal. Sometimes people forget to mention that. that the, uh, and then N equals zero term in this direct sum should be identified with one if one is in the algebra. And uh, you can, a simple example is the, is the Heisenberg algebra. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, the primary object in algebraic quantum mechanics is the quantum algebra of pre-observables. And states are then represented as positive linear functionals. And the physical meaning of the states uh, it, it, of these positive linear functionals is that it's giving you the expectation value of the pre-observable in that particular state. But what we really need is we need a Hilbert space representation. Why do we need a Hilbert space representation? Because uh, eventually we want to deal with the dynamics, which is, which is the Hamiltonian uh, and constraints. And these rarely lie in your basic quantum algebra. Uh, so uh, representation of, uh, of, the, of the quantum star algebra is just some, it's just some map from your algebra to the space of linear operators on some Hilbert space such that the multiplication and the uh, star operation are uh, correctly represented. And it's important to note that states are really represent mixed states. The algebraic states could, can be both pure and mixed. So how do we select a representation? The first condition we can require is that it have some vacuum state. So that basically all states in the Hilbert space can be uh, generated uh, from some vacuum state by actions of your algebra. And, the, and that's what we call a cyclic representation. And cyclic implies that the representation is irreducible. It's not quite the converse. So it's a little bit stronger than irreducible. And in that case, you can uh, construct the, the representation uniquely from this choice of vacuum state using this GNS construction. Uh, and uh, if we have some symmetry group uh, of the algebra that we want to uh, act unitarily in the, in the Hilbert space, then what we want to do is we want to impose that this state be invariant under this symmetry group. And of course, uh, the, what I'm modeling this after is the, is the lost theorem for in full loop quantum gravity, which Christian went over. So in loop quantum cosmology, of course, we're imposing homogeneity and isotropy, which is basically the, Coper the Copernican principle, something which is also very well um, uh, confirmed by observations of the cosmic microwave background to a great degree of accuracy. Uh, and when we impose homogeneity and isotropy in a certain fixed coordinate system and gauge, uh, the basic variables of, of loop quantum gravity become proportional to Kronecker deltas, essentially. Uh, and so you just have one degree of freedom. And here I'm giving, I'm writing the Poisson brackets um, so that the, this V naught appears explicitly there. V naught is the coordinate volume of a cell which is fixed. Because when you're constructing this quantization, when you integrate the, um, the uh, um, symplectic current in order to obtain a symplectic structure, in order to get a finite symplectic structure, you have to integrate only over a finite cell. And so your Poisson brackets end up depending inversely on the coordinate volume. 
Usually this V naught is absorbed into C and P through a redefinition of variables, but here I'm keeping it here explicit for clarity later on. And so the only diffeomorphism freedom that preserves this form of A and E are, uh, first of all, there's parity, which acts on the C and P variables just by negating them, and then dilations, which act in this way, which is a little bit different than the action of dilations, which Christian mentioned, because when I've been puzzling about how to define dilations. You'll see why a little later in the talk, why it's, it's difficult to define dilations in loop quantum cosmology uh, and the isotropic theory. But uh, an, an earlier solution which we came up with was uh, to allow the dilations to act on the fiducial cell. So that, because the, the fixing of the fiducial cell, it breaks this residual diffeomorphism freedom by choosing something of a fixed size. And so the idea was to just let the uh, dilations act on this background structure and then you recover covariance. And uh, that worked, but then when you use this action of dilations to try to select dynamics, you have problems. And so uh, this is the reason why I'm revisiting how to define the dilations here. So, but this is the action of dilations that you get when you just act with the diffeomorphisms on A and E. This is what you get naturally. Uh, and with the, if we had a acted on the uh, fiducial cell as well, then this E to the minus two lambda would be an E to the lambda. But, but this is the, the, really the geometrically natural action. Uh, so now we, come to the choice of the classical Poisson algebra. Well, the classical, Poiss the classical Poisson algebra used in loop quantum gravity is just the, the fluxes uh, together with uh, the uh, parallel transports. And if we just restrict this, each element in this space of functions to the, to the cosmological phase space, we get exactly this. So we get uh, almost periodic functions of C plus functions of C which vanish at infinity and then multiples of P, which was proved by Christian back in 2010. They're arbitrary. Exactly. Now, um, if I want to define the action of a transformation on my quantum algebra, normally I would start uh, with some transformation on my uh, phase space, which, uh, of course, it has to preserve my uh, classical Poisson algebra of observables. And then once it does that, it's obvious how to make it act on this. Um, that should be a direct sum. <laughs> and then so should that. Uh, how it acts on this direct sum of tensor product, it's obvious how, how it will act that way. Um, but then you need to lift it to the quotient space. And you will only be able to lift it to the quotient space if it, uh, if it, pres if it preserves this ideal. Uh, and in particular, uh, we will only be able to lift a transformation to the quantum algebra if it preserves the Poisson brackets. And dilations do not preserve the Poisson brackets, because if you look at the Poisson brackets, uh, the left-hand side will change by e to the minus 3 lambda, and the right-hand side will not change at all. Um, and so the, the only residual diffeomorphism satisfying uh, th this property, that it will lift to the quantum algebra in this simple way, is parity, which is not enough to get the uniqueness. Uh, so the solution, the idea is to, to not define the dilations in this way, but to define it, the, ac the action directly on the quantum algebra. And in particular, for certain uh, special elements of the algebra, it's obvious how the action should be. So for elements of the algebra, which are just powers of p, it's obvious that they should scale they should uh, uh, transform exactly as in the classical case. And also, if you have functions of C, they should transform exactly as in the classical case. The only, amb the only ambiguity is how the dilations should act on mixed terms. Uh, and for that, you need to choose an ordering. So if you give me an arbitrary element of the algebra, uh, you, then the, the prescription would be to uh, first cast that element of the algebra so that it has a certain specific ordering. For example, here you could choose a, a vial ordering of the, of the momenta and uh, configuration parts, uh, and then act with this obvious prescription on, on each factor. Here's another possible uh, ordering. So, so there's an ambiguity in how you would extend it to the mixed terms, but for the momentum and configuration terms, there's no ambiguity. Um, so the point is, for the, this, as, as Christian was just pointing out, 
what's needed in the uniqueness theorem is only the action on the momenta. And so the point is it's irrelevant. And earlier I thought that you also needed the action on the, on the functions of C, which also would have been fine, but we don't even need that. So the uniqueness theorem goes through and you get the same answer no matter how you extend it to the mixed terms. <coughs> Um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so what's selected is, uh, is, the, is the usual representation of, uh, is, is, is the state which Christian just, just derived, uh, which, which when you use the GNS construction gives you the usual uh, kinematical Hilbert space in uh, loop quantum cosmology that's been used since 2003. Um, and uh, many people are familiar with this space, but not everyone's. But it's actually very simple to characterize this space. It's basically, you have as an orthonormal basis the eigenstates of momenta, which there should be an I there. Uh, and the point is that they're normalizable. Uh, and so that a general state is going to be some countable linear combination of the momentum uh, eigenstates where the coefficients are square summable. And uh, yeah, so uh, as I just mentioned, we're selecting the, um, the same representation that's been used since, since 2003. Of course, the, strictly speaking, it's um, the, uh, the algebra which was used for quantizing uh, LQC in the start was a little bit different because they restricted uh, parallel transports to, to be only on, um, uh, along straight edges, whereas here we've allowed arbitrary analytic edges. Uh, so strictly speaking, the algebra was slightly smaller uh, but the point is that if we restrict this representation to the, to, to the, repres to the algebra with only straight edges, you get the, the standard one that's always been used. And so here we actually get an action of some more operators. We also get an action of operators with, uh, for, for parallel transports with curved edges. Um, and even though this is, uh, you know, we're, we're confirming what the, the standard uh, framework, which has always been used, it's not, it has to be emphasized that this is not a trivial result because this is not what one would have guessed based on a naive Schrodinger quantization. So now uh, uh, I'm going to go on to dynamics. Um, so um, I just thought, why, why not try to apply these ideas uh, of uniqueness to dynamics. How f I wanted to push how far we could go with uniqueness. Um, and then there is some earlier work by uh, Alejandro Carici and, and Param Singh where they considered uh, basically, a, I think it was a one parameter family of dynamics where they, they select one. Um, but I wanted to do something as broad as possible without starting from some, some family of dynamics. And uh, this is work with my student, Ilya Valensky. And what we're going to see is that, uh, is that if we require that the Hamiltonian constraint be invariant under the action of dilations, uh, and that together with a, a certain minimality assumption, which I'll define, uh, this is going to select uniquely the, the standard APS dynamics among, from among all operators on the Hilbert space. Specifically, these are the conditions that we impose. We impose covariance under dilations. I'll uh, mention how this is defined in a, in a minute. Uh, invariance under parity, hermeticity. Uh, there's this one assumption here, which I'm not totally happy with, but uh, it, it seems like a very natural assumption, that the domain of the operator should contain at least one volume eigenstate. I, I think that this assumption can be removed, but it's, it's tricky to figure out how to. Uh, part of the trickiness is the non-separability of the Hilbert space. Uh, we impo impose the correct classical limit, and I'll define that shortly, and then the minimality criterion. So after we impose all these other conditions, H will have a natural expression in terms of a sum of terms, and uh, the minimality criterion is just that this number of terms should be minimal, some sort of Occam's razor. Uh, and here's the uh, expression for the Hamiltonian that you get, uh, where here I'm allowing uh, a general not a completely general lapse, but two choices of, of lapse that are often used in the literature is the one corresponding to proper time and harmonic time, and those correspond to uh, n equals 0 and 1 here. So I'm c considering both of those possibilities at the same time. So, 
So I, I gave earlier uh, an action of dilations uh, defined on uh, on the quantum algebra, but the problem is I need to extend this action to all operators on the Hilbert space. Uh, so the strategy that we took uh, is to note that even though uh, dilations are not canonical transformations, they don't preserve the Poisson brackets, as we noted earlier, uh, nevertheless the flow is proportional to a canonical flow. If you have some phase space function and you flow it under dilations, this is equal to some generator uh, the Poisson bracket of some generator with that function times some multiplicative function. And if we just, uh, we can solve for these, for this uh, generator lambda and this uh, factor omega and require that it to have the right flow, and when we do that, this is the most general expression that we get, uh, basically. And it turns out that this m coefficient doesn't matter and the l coefficient doesn't matter because when we plug them into this equation, they drop out. And so this is the flow equation uh, that we get. Here, uh, in addition, uh, I haven't uh, exactly, in, in addition to uh, plugging these expressions um, into this flow equation, I've also exponentiated lambda because, it's, cause, because lambda depends on this function b, which is, um, which is basically proportional to the Hubble rate. b is the... Uh, the variable which is conjugate to v, as Tomas was mentioning. So this is the equation which we're going to quantize. Uh, and uh, where these are exponentiated because that's what's going to be defined in the quantum theory. Uh, and when we quantize it, there's a straightforward way of quantizing where the Poisson brackets become uh, commutators. And, uh, but then there's a choice here of, a, of an operator product. And uh, for concreteness, I just choose the, the, we just choose the, the vial ordering. Uh, however, the result is basically independent of this choice. You can, choose a, you can start from a very broad family, basically the broadest family I could think of, uh, of uh, operator orderings. And it's, uh, the final result is independent of this. Um, <clears throat> so this expression depends on mu, this parameter mu. Uh, and one thing we want is we want this, this prescription to reduce to the usual unitary flow for, uh, for the case of canonical transformation. So in particular, um, so if, if omega is equal to a, a constant, then it'll be a, um, a canonical flow. And in order to get the standard unitary flow, we actually need to take the limit as mu goes to zero. So this is the actual equation which we're going to use. So that's a generalization of what's, what's standard. Uh, and then when we plug in our expressions for omega and lambda, then um, this is the expression that we get when we expand out the commutator. Now, because of the appearance of B and V, it's natural to use uh, the, the eigenstates of V as a, as a basis. And in particular, the way we solve for H is we consider matrix elements of the Hamiltonian constraint and eigenstates of V. And uh, if we set these matrix elements equal to a, a function, uh, f of this uh, defined in this way, then the differential equation is just a simple uh, ordinary differential equation, which we can then solve um, for each, each w, which represents the difference of these eigenvalues. And if we solve this, this differential equation and then uh, reconstruct the operator, then uh, and if we impose that, uh, the, that the operator be parity invariant or emission and have at least one volume eigenstate in its domain, then this is the general form that we get. And so this, actu this actually ends up imposing uh, an ordering. Uh, we started by choosing the vial ordering for this, uh, for this operator product, uh, but in the end it's selecting a slightly different looking ordering when we solve the differential equation, which is, fortunately, happens to be the exact sort of ordering which appears in APS. Uh, so, the, so this ordering suggests the definition of a quantization map with that ordering, uh, which then gives us this uh, simpler expression. Uh, and then the next step is to make the assumption that we have only a single length scale. So the only length scale in the, in the, uh, in the theory is allowed to be the, the Planck length. And this allows us to insert the Planck length uh, in all places with the appropriate powers depending on the dimensions of, of what's appearing there. Um, and so once we have the Planck length appearing in the right places, then, and, and, and because we've expressed this in terms of a quantization map, we can just 
take the hat off, so we can define the, uh, the, the, uh, the classical analog to be the, the, an element of the, of the pre-image of the quantization map, which would be this. Um, and then we take the limit as, as the Planck length goes to zero, and that's how we define the classical limit. Uh, and it's true that um, there's a dependence on the choice of a quantization map here, but because we are taking the limit as LP goes to zero, this choice doesn't really matter. So when I impose that I have the right classical limit, then I just get three equations, three linear, well, they're not quite linear, but the, they're not that complicated equations. Um, and so these conditions, together with the form that we found, then gives us the most general quantum Hamiltonian constraint, which is covariant under all residual diffeomorphisms, is Hermitian, has single length scale, and has the correct classical limit. And what's included in this family is, first of all, the APS Hamiltonian. It's actually with the exact ordering, by chance. Uh, and then other Hamiltonians which have been proposed. Basically, all mu bar type Hamiltonians appear in this. And uh, the mu naught type Hamiltonians do not. Uh, and if we impose minimality, that you have the minimal number of terms, which is three, then you get exactly the, the APS Hamiltonian up to a constant. There's this constant A, which uh, is fixed um, in, in terms of the, the area gap. And, and when you fix that constant A, then you get the, the APS Hamiltonian, which I feel is the, is the strongest uniqueness result we could have hoped for. Even in loop quantum cosmology, in order to, um, to fix this, they have to uh, you have to uh, bring in input from the outside of LQC. You have to bring input from, from the full theory, from the dynamics of the full theory. So it's not surprising that here also we need some, some input from the full theory. Now, I mentioned to you that the result is actually independent of the operator product. So if I consider a more general operator product, and I, I want this to apply for an arbitrary operator O, so I don't want to split up O, uh, because if I start splitting up O, I have to make assumptions about O. No, it's just an oper it's just an operator product that is that is just being used uh, in um, in order to quantize the flow equation, which is defining the dilations, just in this one place. But if we consider a more general uh, operator product, uh, then it's true that you you get a different. Hamiltonian constraint, which is selected, which will have a, a different ordering. But, but, but the, the important point here is, uh, is that what matters is the large volume limit of the theory, because the volume V appearing in the theory is actually the volume of the fiducial cell. And the fiducial cell has no physical meaning. It's an infrared regulator. And so you need to remove this regulator. And so so what you can do, there's a couple of different ways to consider the large volume limit of the Hamiltonian. You can either look at the effective Hamiltonian, which, I, which uh, essentially is a, a classical analog, the classical analog of the Hamiltonian, uh, and then see if, see if the two, and then we would say that two Hamiltonians give equivalent dynamics if they're asymptotic to each other in the lar large volume limit. Uh, or if we want to say that the exact operators are equivalent, I tried to come up with some condition. So I tried to say that the, I, tried, I made the condition that the, uh, that, the, uh, that the matrix elements should essentially be asymptotic to each other. I had to put a constant C here because uh, in the, in the, if you look at um, the, um, the matrix elements, when one of these V's goes to plus infinity and the other V goes to minus infinity, these just will go to zero. And, uh, and so you just get, have a limit of 0 over 0. So the, the adding of the constant here is just to avoid 0 over 0. And, and the answer, and, and so the statement is, is that uh, no matter what uh, operator product you use to define the dilations, in the end, your, your Hamiltonian constraint is, is equivalent to the one that we just uh, selected, the APS Hamiltonian. Uh, and if that's always the case if, if you just look at the effective uh, Hamiltonians and take the, the asymptotic limit of that. But if we restrict our, at least if we restrict ourselves to a finite number of terms, uh, then, it's, then it's also true in this sense. And it's not surprising, perhaps it's not surprising that um, you have this independence of uh, operator ordering ambiguities because of this V naught which is appearing in the Poisson bracket relations. 
which also appears in the, in the Poisson bracket relations between B and V. So that, the, uh, so that essentially in the quantum theory, in the large volume limit, these things commute. One time, in one, in one paper by uh, Carlo and Ed Wilson Ewing, they even went so far as to say that loop quantum cosmology is therefore a classical theory, which I think is, <laughs> is going too far. It's, it's obvious that you have uh, wave functions which um, have a lot more information in them than you have uh, than a, that's in a point in the phase space. But nevertheless, this is a very curious property in loop quantum cosmology that the ordering seems to not matter when you remove the infrared regulator. So let's discuss a bit about this result. So I want to emphasize that you know, the, the purpose of, of this uniqueness theorem is not to close discussion, because people are now exploring other dynamics. And uh, one limitation of this uh, way of selecting dynamics in LQC is that it uses exactly zero information about dynamics in the full theory. The only information from loop quantum gravity used is the use of the holonomy flux algebra. And ultimately, what one of the ultimately what we want to do with, with loop quantum cosmology is we want to use it to be able to test different proposals for dynamics in the full theory in the context of cosmology. So we, we really want these Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian constraint in LQC to, to be directly related to some choice of dynamics in the full theory. So I, and those dynamics seem to end up being non-minimal. But, uh, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's remarkable that just with one extra assumption, this minimality assumption, you do get uniqueness. And, uh, and even these, res these results without the minimality, it, it gives you a much better control over the space of possible dynamics. Um, I don't think anything like this, I can't imagine anything like this being possible in the full theory. I think it's just far too complicated. But at least here where we have one degree of freedom, it was, it was possible. So what uh, extensions can we do for this work? Well, first of all, we can try to include homogeneous scalar matter, which so far is the matter which people usually use in, in loop quantum cosmology. And um, there, the classical action of dilations is uh, the, the pi is a density, and so the pi scales, but, but, phi, but the, the scalar field does not, because it's just a scalar field. Um, the basic classical algebra descending from LQG, usually you use these, this uh, polymer quantized, these, uh, this polymer algebra where you have these uh, point holonomies of the scalar field. And so you end up having, again, almost periodic functions of the, of the scalar field plus uh, multiples of, of the momentum. And so it's almost the same situation as in the gravitational sector. The only difference is that uh, the dilations are not acting on phi. Um, and so, actually, I had the, so I was wondering, can we still get a unique representation? And if so, is it the same uh, Bohr-Hilbert space representation? And actually, with Christian's new proof, the answer is yes. <laughs> because with Christian's new proof, all you really need is the, is the action on the, on the momentum. So, so this, is, this is something which should be written up and, <laughs> and published. Um, but, and so, you know, once you have this, um, this uniqueness result for the matter sector, for the kinematics of the matter sector, then uh, you can look at the arguments that we used in the, in the foregoing slides, and uh, you can apply the same arguments to select a unique uh, matter Hamiltonian. And you can check that in the large volume limit, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's equal to the, to the matter Hamiltonian, which is considered in this work here. These are some notes from one of the, um, these are some notes from one of the uh, uh, Zakopane schools. Uh, where they consider uh, the uh, loop quantum cosmology is coupled to a, a polymer scalar field. Normally, the scalar field is quantized using a Schrodinger quantization in LQC. But in this, in this work of Yurik and, uh, and others, uh, they show that even if you start with a, a polymer uh, quantized scalar field, in the end, after you solve the Hamiltonian constraint, it's equivalent. There's no difference in the theory. Uh, from when, from if you use the, the Schrodinger representation from the start. And so, 
in the end, again, you're going to get a, a matter term which is equivalent to the APS matter in the end. Um, another possible extension is to a non-isotropic model. So all the results on the prior slides have, have basically been extended to Bianchi 1. Uh, it's, the, there are some, te uh, some things in the, in the work that I've presented which is more refined than, than, uh, than this work uh, that, uh, that uh, Ilya and I did uh, on the, in the Bianchi 1 case. We, we could improve this work a bit, but basically it's, it's been extended to the Bianchi 1 case. Uh, considering other, well here, this is, this is not a non-isotropic model. This is an isotropic model. If we consider the isotropic k equals 1 model, we definitely get a, an obstacle because there are no residual diffeomorphisms in that case. There's actually neither infinitesimal nor large diffeomorphisms. I don't even think parity is defined. Yeah? Mapping of this field just. Yeah, but I think the, like, I, th I believe. So I think that's, that's much, I mean, I don't know. I'm just thinking about it as I was reading the slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I thought about it a little bit, and I thought thought I had um, shown that um, if if you identify the the spatial manifold with uh, SU two, that basically parity corresponds to the inverse map, and the inverse map maps all of the right invariant vector fields into the left invariant vector fields, and of course you're using the using either one or the other for your gauge fixing condition, and so it doesn't preserve the gauge fixing condition. At least that's, well, that was the conclusion I came to. Maybe it's wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, some other further tasks and thoughts about how one might use this work. Um, so, uh, without the minimality criterion, here we've isolated a whole class of Hamiltonian constraints. Some of them have already appeared in the literature, uh, and people are, um, are investigating the phenomenological consequences of them, which is what we should be doing. We should, uh, this is when we finally make contact with data, this is where the science is actually happening. But here we have, well, I guess it's best to, to start investigating models where we have some reason to believe they might come from the full theory. Um, another thing is, uh, is, that this, is that this family of, of possible dynamics uh, gives us a new tool in trying to figure out uh, what dynamics in loop quantum cosmology might correspond to a, a given dynamics in the full theory. Like I know, this, the, for example, this work with that, um, that uh, Klaus and Andrea did, uh, where they derived um, what is now sometimes called the, the, the uh, uh, ligonier dapor model. Um, they, what they derived was a mu naught scheme. And, um, and the thing is, it would, it, we know that, uh, that, the, that the dynamics in LQC has to be a, a mu bar form. And, and if we already know what the possible dynamics are, we can use that to our advantage. So one of the ideas I had was possibly to take this, this uh, series uh, and just truncate it at some finite n. And then the dynamics is just specified by a finite number of parameters. And then you just need a, a finite number of pieces of information from the full theory to fix the dynamics. I, it, at least it gives, uh, it suggests other ways of possibly uh, deriving dynamics for LQC from the full theory, which will automatically give you something in the mu bar scheme. Um, oh, another thing. So um, even though now I'm much more happy with the action of dilations on the algebra defined here, uh, that's just an action of dilations on the elementary algebra. and uh, and this flow, which we've defined to, um, to, to uh, select the dynamics, actually the, the flow is not well defined. What's well defined is the covariance condition. So, uh, because in general, if, if I, um, 
if I try to calculate the flow uh, of a general operator, you, there are, you get some infinities sometimes depending for certain choices of operator. It's like I, I'm not even sure how to flow the um, just the, the, the usual e to the i mu c uh, in the original algebra using this uh, um, using the, using the flow equation. But it does give us a, a covariance condition. And uh, so, I have the, so we have these two ways of, of imposing dilations, one on the basic algebra and another on operators which are covariant. And they're consist these two definitions are consistent with, with each other for appropriate choice of uh, ordering for the mixed algebra terms. But is there, is there some definition of dilations which would act on all operators? And I don't know the answer to that. That would be nice. Um, another interesting idea is uh, instead of impl um, imposing covariance on, on an operator such as the Hamiltonian constraint, you could consider imposing invariance of, uh, of a density matrix. And what would it, I don't know, um, uh, would it make sense to impose uh, that, that, to consider uh, dilation invariant states in loop quantum cosmologies? At least it, it uh, opens up that as a possibility, as, as something to look at. Uh, so that's, that's all I have for my talk, and uh, happy birthday, Eric. Okay, so thank you. There is uh, time for a short question, comment. Just, um, just a question. Um, you mentioned that all the results are also valid for Bianchi 1, for the non embeddable case, then, probably, or do you have it for the embeddable case? Oh, yes, that's a good point. So the point is that for the, Bian for the Bianchi 1 case, we have to restrict to, to uh, edges which are adapted to the symmetry. So y yes. Any other comments or questions? If not, let's thank John again.